What is up guys, we doubles back here in the brand new video and today we're gonna be playing some dragon flight on our brand new Volpera from the last video, make uwu. And we are going to be getting all the way to 70, trying professions on this guy, leveling him up all the way to max in some regards and getting into PVP for the first time with a full PVP set farmed out and solo shuffle finally engaged with. I'll give my opinion on solo shuffle right now and it's pretty good and I'll show you guys my progress thus far. So I hope you guys enjoy the video. Let's jump right in. So today, my friends, I want to hyper focus on something that most of you watching, since you're on my channel, we typically do, you know, old school versions of WoW, you know, vanilla WoW, Ascension's in Wrath, but basically it's mostly TBC and vanilla, whether it's vanilla plus or turtle WoW or any of the other crap we've tried, hell, even the Naruto world, none of it is often modern WoW. And so you probably wouldn't know much about solo shuffle solo shuffle is a brand new reimagining of pvp rated pvp specifically on world of warcraft that i really think is very interesting because it hyper focuses on quite literally what's in the name being a solo pvp -er. that means just like in a game like league of legends or hell even in a game like lost ark you can queue up solo by yourself and acquire a rating through an MMR system uh, with just your own personal skill and a little bit of the luck of the draw with your teammates being the determining factor in whether you win or whether you lose. Now we will talk more about it and the whole video is not just solo shuffle but solo shuffle does become a focal point because solo shuffle to me is the best thing to ever happen to World of Warcraft PvP and I do have real reasons for that so later on I'll go over the pros, I'll go over some cons and some general thoughts on on solo shuffle because it does actually look like Blizzard is willing to make things better. I know it's crazy, but I am the type of person that believes in forgiveness and if they want to make a good game, I'm going to accept a good game. If they don't, then whatever. We can just keep harping on the past because they'll deserve it. But this could be great and I really do just want to highlight it today because it was extremely fun for me. A little frustrating sometimes too, but again, we'll get into all of that. But my friends, it all begins with little Mikuwu. Now, in my last video, I decided to go 10 to 60 with the whole point being to follow some dude's viral video. Uh, he's a smaller YouTuber. I don't even think he does this full time, but he's trying to maybe. So maybe go seek him out. You can see my last video where I put a link to his channel and his video rather in there. And uh, he's trying to show us this idea of leveling super fast, 10 to 60, three hours time. And I really wanted to put that to the test because I really love the idea of leveling fast. I don't like leveling in versions of WoW where the end game is all that matters. I love leveling in versions of WoW though where it's not all that matters. Like let's say vanilla WoW or old school versions of Project Ascension. But when the end game is all that matters, you turn the leveling experience into a really nasty, boring chore. So you've got to do either something that you like while leveling, which is not often that common, or you got to get to max level ASAP. So three hours was really, really nice, right? Except it turns out, and you guys let me know in the comment section after the fact as well, that this guy apparently was leveling with uh, super speed runny tactics. He apparently had all sorts of buffs and stuff giving him bonus XP. I think some of which aren't even available right now. Stuff like the Dark Moon Fair as well. And so it's not really realistic. How long did it take me using his guide though? Uh, and not having any of those buffs and maybe sneaking in a few extra quests here and there? 12 hours. Four times as long, right? Some of you guys have mentioned doing it in six, seven hours, especially when you play things like Monk, because Monk gets more XP, and yeah, that makes perfect sense. I do think if I leveled a third alt that way, or even a fourth one, I would bring it down to maybe nine hours, and then maybe six after that. I really do believe that if I stayed with Horde and didn't try to deviate to the Alliance side. So overall, even though it was way longer than advertised, a little clickbaity, even though that's the norm, I can't judge him too hard, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, it was a pretty good guide. But now I'm level 60, and I thought, what am I going to do now? I mean, I got to get to level 70 and I certainly want to do it fast. So I started off by, well, abusing the time walking dungeons, right? Now, if you don't know, time walking dungeons are dungeons on Dragonflight that allow you to basically go back and play previous expansions dungeons. Sometimes it'll be Warlords of Draenor, sometimes it'll be Mist of Pandaria, and you queue up and you go into one of those dungeons. You then get some special rewards, some currency that allows you to buy gear from that era, but boost it up to the item level that's relevant in your expansion, in this case, Dragonflight, and the ability to buy reputation reputation tokens, basically, that allow you to, for example, with me, with Mr. Pandaria, I went ahead and I got it all the way up with the anglers so that I could get the mounts, because once upon a time, you wanted that mount because it was the only one that could walk on water, and so that was a big deal. But I would have never got that normally. I only did it because I was able to
able to spam time walking dungeons and purchase their reputation basically just with a dungeon grind. So this is relevant because for my character I was able to get about 80 to 90,000 XP just for completing the dungeon plus some XP for doing it. They're also super fast. They complete way faster than a regular dungeon. So you could think of something like 10 minutes per dungeon sometimes. And what that essentially meant is that if I only need 240,000 ish XP to gain a level, it only takes three of those to gain a level. And because they're so fast, way faster than a regular dungeon that you would queue for, plus they're giving more XP, I got five levels in almost no time. The only reason I didn't keep going was because I knew I wanted to do some PvP. Now this leads me to something that I'm just going to recommend to you guys. Some of you guys are trying Dragonflight, you don't have as much time to play, so you might be a little bit behind compared to what you see on my screen or some other streamer screens where I'm even way behind. And so I just want to give you some advice if you even think about making a new character even. Anything that would mean you're kind of new. And what I would say is, if you want to do any kind of PvP at all, take some time while leveling to just max out your honor. You don't even have to honor cap, I think you only need something like maybe not even 10,000 honor to buy the entire PvP set. I had 15k obviously, I capped out uh, from 65 to 70 and you're seeing that right now. And I gotta say, it was a whole lot of fun. Now obviously the 60 to 69 bracket is complete cancer in the beginning. But once you actually start to be able to get gear like everybody else seems to have, once you get to 65, 66, 68, 69, and you can buy gear off the auction house, uh, or maybe you have heirlooms that scale that high, I'm not sure how the heirlooms are working right now, but I had to buy gear off the auction house, then you start hitting back and then it starts to really feel like it's actually fun and uh, that was an awesome experience and because I did that when I hit max level, which I did, I was able to immediately, as I alluded to before, buy a full set of PvP gear, and I never one time had to PvP at max level. I think this is very significant, and I'll go over why, but what this ultimately means, as far as I can see, and I'm not sure if the previous expansion was like this, but this does feel new to me, is that it looks like on World of Warcraft now, you can just PvP and that's it. You don't theoretically have to do any PvE content nothing. You can just BG in Arena if that's what your heart wants you to do. And I find that fascinating because I'm the kind of guy that does every type of content. But as a result, it's advantageous for me for each bit of content to be streamlined so that they only require very specific stuff from those pieces of content themselves. And you might say, why would that be? Well, it's because what if I want to PvP and I want to PvE, but I'm playing a class that's not particularly good at one of those, but is really good at the other. So then you're telling me if I want to make a PvP all like I just did right now. I have to randomly start caring about mythics or even raids or any kind of crap like that. And then there's another side of it too that we'll end up getting to, which is this whole idea of typically when you reach max level and you're not actually going along with the pack, so you're making an alt or you join an expansion late, you kind of have to go through a college fraternity hazing when you do BGs at the beginning of your like max level journey. And that's because you're sitting there in greens or maybe some dungeon blues. You're going up against people with full PvP sets. And for some reason, because of the way while wow, PvP and WoW power levels work with item levels and such, uh, max level players in full PvP gear basically treat you, a fresh guy, right, with maybe one piece if you're lucky, as if you were just like a level 10. I mean, you really can't do anything, like the power level difference is so high, so it's actually a disgustingly unfun experience, and it actually takes a bit of mental fortitude just to get through that fraternity hazing and get to the point where now you get to actually have skill, because prior to this, skill probably almost never mattered in your battle ground journeys. Whenever you fought somebody, you prayed they had gear that was near yours. If they did, then you could have a fight. If they didn't and it was way higher, you auto lost. And that sucks, especially when the grind takes a long time. And that's where they often got it wrong. It's like, yeah, you could farm a whole PvP set and you'd be okay sometimes, but how long is it going to take you? And how many times are you going to lose through no fault of your own? just because you haven't got that gear yet, which you're obviously trying to go for. PvP players don't like to grind, I promise you that. In fact, I'll amend that and say they do like to grind, but only one thing, it's their PvP rating. Th nothing else, man. There's nothing else a PvP player likes less than grinding, unless it's their rating. And so this is what Dragonflight has done really well. As I said, I didn't have to do a single BG at max until I already had a full set of PvP gear. This made me immediately feel confident, it made me immediately feel ready to go, and it meant as soon as I go into BGs, I'm actually practicing with my actual power level against other people who are at their actual power levels, which means when I get into Arena, I know what's going on. Now, with that being said, I'll talk more about how there are epic PvP pieces that you can go for. They are better than the blue PvP set that I got when I got to level 70. However, it is a smaller gap. 
and you might have rolled your eyes at smaller gap, right? You're like, aha, here's where, you know, the big year gap comes and everything's going to get bad in two months. It's actually really easy to get it. Easy by my standards. And since I've played WoW for so long, I really just see through all the garbage. You know, I'm not jaded anymore when it comes to like a 50, like I'm the kind of guy that said, you want me to farm for an allied race? You're crazy. Like, you think I'm stupid? Respect me more. Of course, I got the Volpera way after the fact because it got easier, right? And it was less of a grind. Let's just say it was more reasonable of a grind. But my case still stands, you know? Like, I'm not going to do something because it's a job. I'm going to play this game because it's fun. And uh, yeah, Dragonflight so far has done a pretty good job of that for me for PvP. So that's my initial spiel, okay? That's what's going down for me. That was my 60 to 70 journey and my thoughts so far. What I want to do now, though, guys, is while we're on Mikuwu, I'll show show you my gear. I've been farming some solo shuffle. I'll just show you my rating. I want to make it very clear before somebody roasts me in the comments, okay? I have literally only been doing solo shuffle for a day. So, so far with my initial grind, we just started. I'm at 1414, although I was at 1431 at one point. And my rounds one versus rounds lost looks like it's 103 rounds one, 89 rounds lost, I believe. So that's not horrible, although it obviously could be better. But again, I'm basically learning as I go and I don't have any high rated experience on Rogue from any previous expansion to go off of. So when you think about one day worth of playing in that regard and everything else I said, quite honestly, I don't think that's bad. I'm actually pretty proud of it and I want to keep going so apparently now I have this they're giving this out like candy now like this doesn't mean anything uh, but I have the challenger title now which is cute you know but I'm not going to use it because I'm a freaking Chad you know so here we are right uh, before we get into a lot of arena matches I'll go over uh, what I think about this what I think about rogue and all this jazz so I got professions basically is what I'm getting to and we got leather working and skinning and I was able to max out my skinning which is pretty freaking sick in my last elemental shaman video I went over these uh, professions specs. I think someday we'll go more into this right now. I am looking up guides and stuff on it, but it looks like it's progressing slower for me, especially as a PvPer, and I think that makes perfect sense. My leatherworking, for example, I sit there and I think to myself, should I even have this as a PvPer? Or is this pointless and I should get rid of it and I should go for mining or something and then maybe just sell all my mats or maybe herbalism actually. That sounds fine too. Let me know in the comment section what you would do with my professions, but I think that makes sense. Also, as for my gear, now we don't have all of this in every clip you'll see, but as the progression of the video goes on and on, we'll go in chronological order and eventually we'll end up with clips where I do have all of this gear. But I was able to get three pieces so far of Crimson Gladiator gear. I got my weapons first. I thought that was probably smart. A lot of the times in different WoW expansions, having the weapons are good. I don't have the money for the super best in chance yet, but I did have enough for just a Sophic Devotion uh, to what would you call it? Two star silver enchant, right? Uh, I want the gold one, but it's like 6k gold. So we'll get there again. It's only PVP on this guy right now. So a little bit more difficult to make gold. That's where maybe those professions I was talking about are really going to come in, but I got my offhand as well. I also got the shoulders. Okay. So that's pretty cool. And for my enchants right now, I am using accelerated agility and you're going to see a theme speed. And uh, over here we have a fierce armor kit, which is basically agility. And then we have speed and then we have versatility. And then, Oh, look at this. We have speed, okay? So we have a lot of speed, all right? A lot of versatility, a lot of speed, and so I have 14% speed. The reason speed is good, and we'll use this as a way to go right into the talents that I'm ending with, although this does change a little bit, and we'll go over this as the video goes on, but the reason speed is good on Rogue is because of the talent fleet-footed, right? 15% more speed, and it does stack with the speed that you get from the enchants. So me just running around, even though it's going to be really hard to see without another player running next to me, I'm way faster than a lot of people. And funnily enough, I do think it plays into the theme, right? Like, I still kind of like to mini roleplay. I like to mini roleplay in the sense of, I'm a little Volpera, and that's cringe in almost every way. But what about the parts where it's not? Like, I run really fast, I'm all, you know, I'm a rogue, right? I'm stealthy, it's hard to see me. That's all kind of cool. And that allows me to kind of get into it. You know, sometimes I'll be in an arena or something, and I'll just play with these people knowing that they see what I'm seeing.
Now, as I said, for my spec, I'm not going to go over every minute decision. We went over some of the spec stuff in my last video, but you can see my spec right here, and I will put the link to it in the description below. We'll talk about various different pros and cons of different talents as the video goes on, but again, it's in the description below. So let's show you guys my very first arena games when we hit max. Okay, so I had a full set of PvP gear, and these clips were starting off with a full set of blue gear. That means every single piece was blue PvP gear, and my item level in arena and BGs is going to be 411 so if you come in with full pve gear i'm gonna clap you with stats alone and that's pretty cool but i couldn't just jump right into the solo shuffle i needed to do some practice first and that's what you're seeing here at least one of them i needed to win 10 skirmishes so that i could complete my daily quest and i thought that would be a wonderful excuse to just learn what's going on right now at max level and uh, a good one if you want occurred in order for me to do that basically anytime i queued into a 2v2 and my opponent was missing their teammate i would ask my teammate to let me 1v1 them and if they wouldn't let me I would let my teammate 1v1 them but the reason I wanted to do it is so I could get in as much actual practice that makes me think and actually play the game as I can rather than just mowing the guy down or something like that. Overall the arena skirms went really well it's both 2v2s and 3v3s and I thought it was good enough for me to try solo skirms so I went ahead and I jumped into my very first three games that I want to show you guys right now. I just want to go over the wins and the losses what I noticed and just really break it down and it'll give you guys an idea of what happened for me throughout the entire journey if I'm honest with you where again you saw my rating we're at like 1411 after one day of playing uh, quite a lot of queues though and I will say one of the problems right off the bat we'll mention it again later is that the queue times are just too long and the long queue times are killer because number one who's to say if it takes literally 20 minutes if you're gonna even be in the same mindset when the queue pops but you can't really say no you waited so long you get in there you're tired or something happened or whatever maybe you're just not as fresh maybe you're not as crisp as you were 20 minutes prior so many things can happen and that's just one part of why a long queue is bad but we'll get more into that later the point is let's jump into these first three games starting off with me and assassination rogue with a pally healer and we have an ellie shaman on the other team we have a fury warrior holy pally and evoker and uh this is actually a really low budget kind of 3v3 like the classes there's some good ones in there but there's some not so good ones right now as well for solo shuffle i didn't know that at the time though now just to reiterate there are six rounds and every round we switch a player out basically you get new people on your team so the combination of players right now is not going to be the same as the combination of players next round and then etc etc so i start off obviously in stealth and i choose not to go for the sprint i also go for a distract because i'm still playing with random stuff at this point which i think is really funny don't get me wrong distract can be good but it was definitely random in this scenario so in the chat i said kill the evoker cc paladin that was my opinion very first game anyway i do go for the sap on the warrior knowing i want to switch that he goes for the nullifying shroud by the way because he thinks he's gonna sap so nullifying shroud as far as i can see just prevents the sap so maybe it's incapacitating effects maybe other things as well luckily that's not who i went to i already got the blind off on the pally at this point and i'm actually taking huge damage because warrior is a broken class and also evoker does big burst as well now i was playing a completely different version of my spec at the time with things like exsanguinate and trying to make those bleed just bleed out faster i had the cold blood as well but right off the bat you could see we're not doing well all of us are at half or less than half and the enemy team is basically all at full with one dude at 70 percent so anyway i go for the cheap shot on the healer just trying to prevent him from being able to play the game for a hot second i think in hindsight i would have focused on that warrior more i learned to peel the warriors more as i play more and more because uh like at first glance i wouldn't think fury warrior is going to be as good as it was but it turns out warrior is one of the best classes i've encountered in solo shuffle in fact every warrior i play with has been basically guaranteed a minimum of four wins every single game which is insane it's like just by being a warrior but anyway we cheap shot that guy i'm immediately off him and i switch back to the kill target at less than half hp now the kill target has five points of wound poison on him right now so he's not going to be healed for a lot and garot's about to go away and he's an evoker so i'm assuming he's being hurt by the mind numbing poison being able to not cast as fast with it on him so i pop that sprint because they could be slippery and I'm getting right in on there now I'm going all in now you can see my trophy GCD add-on right above my portrait right there and also what my enemy does above their portrait as well so you will be able to see what I'm doing in order I go for the Garo as a result immediately we renew all of our poisons right and he immediately slips away so the sprint I am still sprinting I have one second left so I feel like that was a decent move maybe I could have waited a second but I'm kind of prepping ahead I jump right off we're right back on that evoker he is silenced right now because I took that 
talent. You can see it on him. And he has the mutilate bleed as well from another talent. So I'm right back on him with four combo points here. I renew my rupture so that I can go for the combos, right? And I know I, what I do, right? Yep, exsanguinate into the death mark. You can do whatever side you want to do with those two abilities. It could be one or the other first. And I just let him bleed. I let him bleed because I noticed that he's not going to die. But if I switch, it puts some pressure on the healer. So I also got off a gouge somehow in the middle of all of this. And now I'm on the warrior. I feign going on the warrior and I switch right back to the evoker. And that's when I just start DPSing him, right? I go for those envenoms, mutilate more envenoms, right? Uh, Shiv always comes first for that extra nature damage. He doesn't die though. And at that point, I'm feeling pretty low because everything was popped. I went all in. And it just wasn't enough. So we continue the match for a hot second. And uh, my healer is getting absolutely trained by that evoker. I switch to the pally. I'm like, well, maybe I can take this guy out. Or at the very bare minimum, I can pressure him a little bit and do a switch, which is the ultimate plan. And as soon as I get that evoker near me, because I don't know why he got so close. Maybe he has to because they have all that AOE, right? That's like maybe only a 20 yard range if I had to guess. I get right back on him. That's the point. I just start laying into him with my consistent assassination rogue pressure. I dodge the fire breath, which is lol. And then I just sit on another guy, the pally this time, I do a little tactical switch because I had just damaged him before. I made him pop bubble, okay? And now I go right back on the evoker. So I'm just doing as much damage as I can. The pally's low. He's trying to heal himself while bubbled. He doesn't want to waste the duration of the bubble. Unfortunately, it's not enough to kill the guy. Switch real quick. Uh, get a garrote off. I like to just, you know, put pressure up, basically. If I can bleed a random guy, I go for it. The evoker is low. I see that guy getting flashes off. I'm sad, but that's okay. I jump right on him. That mind-numbing poison's now on him, you know? He's casting slower. Right back on the evoker, okay? I'm gonna start laying into him. Fire breath comes out. I don't think I have to dodge that. No, he tries to go for it again. He doesn't get it. That guy's spamming flash. I'm putting the mind-numbing poison back on him. We're back on the evoker at this point, and uh, at this point, I'm thinking to myself, damn it, where's the rupture, bro? That should have come out sooner. I think I tunnel vision the envenoms. People start getting topped off, and boom, my healer dies. You really thought I was gonna show you a win, right? But no. So I will just go ahead and say, we do go 3-3, three, three, so I'm not actually that on happy with that. I mean, it's a lot better than going negative. And of course we had no clue what was going on. No clue what the meta was going to be like. And clearly at this point, we didn't have our spec down packed yet. And this one though, we jump right in. I'm looking at the scoreboard, right? I'm thinking to myself, Jesus Christ, the freaking evoker and the warrior are doing nearly double my damage. It's unbelievable. So we start the match with the idea that I'm going to go hard on that evoker. I get him to half super duper quickly with my partner there. I've got everything stacked up on him, ready to go. And uh, this is the point where I start to feel like, oh no, the pally opponent is really keeping up this evoker and he's not even bopping yet. That scares me. If he had to waste a bop, a hand of protection that is, I would feel much better. So the evoker is slippery. He does end up getting away. However, the other guy on my team goes for the pally. The pally's in front of me. I switch pally. This is actually insane. It forces the pally to bubble and then he gets pulled away off the bubble. But the pull was basically irrelevant at that point. So it looks like there was a bit of miscommunication, something you're really only going to get in solo shuffle. How good are you and how often will you make a mistake and use something when you shouldn't layer CC, something like that. So it goes hectic for a bit. I'm right in the middle of the fight. I try to stick on that pally, but you can see I'm always keeping up other stuff on everybody else at all times, because at some point there might be an opportunity to switch and then blow up a different target. Pally's at half. I'm switching constantly. I go up Groat right there on the warrior. That's also crippling him real quick, almost certainly. I go back on the evoker, mind numbing, gouge, boom. Let's move on. Back on the warrior real quick, stun him real quick, back on the pally. Let's get that wound poison up because you know what? My partner wants to stay on the pally. Maybe he's correct. Sometimes it's about putting confidence in your team, less about what you think is right and what you don't think is right, okay? I'm literally going to die. I start to get depressed. I'm like, no, no, no. I don't even have my Crimson Vial going just yet. Yeah, I guess I didn't realize that I had it there. I don't know why I didn't click on it. I'm looking at it right now in post. I'm like, why? Oh, I use it finally. Thank God it didn't matter. Could have. I go right on the pally though. Now, with my teammate laying it into him right now, the pally is super low. He already bubbled. We blow him up at the end with an envenom and ultimately we win. And honestly, if these two games don't tell you where I'm at right now, I feel like I'm good. I do feel like I'm actually just solid at the game. I'm pretty good at the game overall. I have some major weaknesses though. Number one, I have a tendency to just try to do as much damage as I can as if you were a PvE target. I think that's new for me. I don't think it's always been that way, but I've been doing almost nothing but PvE for like a year now in a very 
normal, casual kind of way. And the way it's worked out for me that I've noticed now is that I'll get on people and I'll be like, okay, I just need to do as much damage as I can instead of looking for burst windows and not just wasting everything on cooldown. So that's a big problem. You don't use everything on cooldown in PvP, obviously. You're supposed to save stuff for when it's opportune. You have to be opportunistic, right? And when you do that, you can move in at the right moment, get your burst off, CC off at the right moments. You don't just randomly do things. And so that's something I'm definitely still working on. I think I've built up bad habits over the years. Next up, though, there's a lot going on with Rogue. So we end up simplifying the build a lot, and I end up looking at some other builds online, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I use some of these other builds with my own brain, and we really limit the spells, will I be able to still perform? Because I'll be more efficient if I don't feel like I'm overwhelmed. So I basically start off feeling like there's too much on my plate. So I occasionally will misclick at some point, not use my combo points. It's interesting because you've definitely already seen matches where I'm able to utilize my combo points exceptionally well at the right moment. And then you could probably see points of these matches where it's like, huh, why did he do that? It's like totally a misclick. There's so much going on. I really love Dragonflight PvP for that alone. There is so much going on and it is reactable and your classes can do damage. Some are doing too much, uh, but that's okay. Things will happen. Nerfs will happen. Nerfs have already happened. Buffs will happen as well, perhaps more importantly. But yeah, as for my weaknesses, I'm treating it like a PvE game and I'm clicking things too often on cooldown rather than thinking. So I've told myself to slow down. That's another thing. Just because I play fast doesn't mean I'm good. I'm definitely faster than most people, okay? But that does not mean I'm always making the right decision. It just means sometimes I can overwhelm you because I'm thinking faster. It just doesn't always work with high rated players because they think fast too, but they actually know what to click. Isn't that something, huh? So as we move up, I've noticed it's already gotten difficult and we're not even that high obviously yet. So those are some cons about myself so far in PvP and some pros I guess as well. And overall, I really enjoy the solo shuffle experience. So in match two, we actually do get four rounds one. I get 379 rating for that, which was a huge whopping amount. It made me feel really good. I got out DPS by a druid. They have the cyclone. They've got a lot going for them right now. Assassination Rogue is incredible as well, by the way. And in my third of my first three rounds, I once again went three and three. So I went two three threes and one three four. The max I've got so far is five rounds one. I've never had six rounds one yet, sadly. I would love that. But so far, I've only seen two different types of people get six rounds one warrior players and healers. That's all I've ever seen. I'm not saying it's impossible for other types of players. I'm just saying that's all I've seen so far. You can extrapolate whatever you want. So I basically did the math real quick. I'm not going to pretend like I'm happy with the results. Theoretically, what this means if I divide everything by six is that roughly on average, I've played about 32 games so far. And my score, if I counted the rounds, is like just a straight win loss. It would be something like 18 wins and 15 losses, which is literally a 55% win rate, which is like fine to build on, but it's it's not 70 80 which is where you'd want to be if you're going to go like 2k plus at least fast right like it's certainly possible to just grind it out maintaining it like 55 percent if it's anything like any other mmr system but yeah that's where i'm at right now but the ultimate thing is going to be do you guys want to see more progression obviously as we get more gear it's going to make things even easier by the way i have 1000 conquest i am in fact conquest point capped for the week so we could buy our fourth piece of gear and you know what i've been seeing a lot of people across all these different guides i've seen not take the on use trinket it used to be back in my day you always took the on use trinket because it was easier to line up your burst assassination rogue though i have a lot more consistent pressure if i was all about burst maybe i would actually want to play sub and i've seen a lot of people just taking this alacrity insignia a chance on hit to get 734 agility for 20 seconds 20 seconds is actually a long time man it's not actually bad i think I think we go for the trinket the only other thing i would consider if i wasn't going to go for this one right is the gladiator's emblem it's just straight agi and also a lot of health i do get bursted down sometimes super quick if i'm totally honest with you that one almost seems more correct because when people switch rogue that's such a good kill target you've got vanish and you've got cloak and you've got evasion and that's like a solid amount of stuff but they all do vastly different things i'm not saying it's the worst class by any means but like it's definitely a weakness i've noticed sometimes Sixty-two thousand health Guys, I think I'm just going to take this. Take it over my badge of ferocity. You know what? I think I talked myself into it. And by the way, we can always buy a different trinket later on. So let's just do it, guys. Boom. I feel good about it. We can go ahead and put this on. And there you go. That's 329 Agi and another 382 up to 424 item level in arenas and BGs. So the epic is 424. The blue is 411. It's 13 item levels. That is a big difference. But especially early on, you're pretty much good to go. You're not going to really fall behind at all. Just grab a full blue set and you'll be able to do what I did and have fun. But number two, I want to make it clear that theoretically, and I have no life, do keep that in mind, but theoretically, I was able to farm 
all of my conquest points and all four of these epic pieces I've gotten so far in only one day worth of play. So I actually do think that's gonna help. I'm at 207K, it goes up obviously in arena, but if I use this, that's so much more HP. So yeah, guys, I did most of my campaign quests too on this guy, by the way. Uh, I've geared him so much, so quickly, and I'm feeling really, really good about it so far. I also have this uh, interesting little daily I really wanna do, but I don't know how to complete it quickly. Unfortunately, I've never tried to do this before, but it's the spark of life daily. If you like PvP, you're going to want to learn how to do this. So I've looked it up and you do get sparks of life from world quests. In this example says Azure Spam, but it depends where the world quest is. For me, it's Thaldrazeus, uh, War Mode just by killing somebody in war mode that is you get only one for that though expedition scout packs that you find some of those require reputation though as far as i can see so if you're pure pvp a lot of those probably aren't even doable killing rares though so that's interesting community feasts if that's in your place and war crates which basically are like drops but typically they're camped by like three or four other people so i've done a lot of things that i can do but i haven't done a lot of the rares so i guess i could try killing the rares we could even look for Eldorin the Reborn, which I guess I'll always look for in basically every video, almost every video. And of course, if you've forgotten by now on my Shaman series, we're going for Eldorin the Reborn because, wait, do I have to find him on my Shaman specifically? Well, I guess I can always log on my Shaman if I see him there real quick. But we have every single one of these complete on my Shaman, except for Eldor and the Reborn. And if we do that, we'll have the Bird Watcher title, which should be account bound, and that's great. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm using the smaller dragon on the Volpera. I actually think it just functions better. I've been doing a lot of dragon races. They're just so freaking fun. But sadly, Eldor and the Reborn is not here. Who would have thought? Now, I do have this interesting one, Blown Through the Wind. I guess they've reset because it is a brand new day for me. This gives bloody tokens, and I don't know what that is. So let's go for it, dude for sure okay it looks like he's dead but i guess he'll respawn wait these guys are fighting okay let's go in this guy's dead too right nice i killed them both lol i got bloody tokens for that too yeah i was kind of scuffed but i haven't played for like three hours while i've been recording and editing so oh, i just popped my brand new stuff oh i'm stunned and the warlock saw me am i gonna die Damn it. So, okay, the warlock came out on top. This guy hates his life right now. He's totally over it. Okay, it's truly bloody out here. I've already been gang destroyed and uh, the boss is up. So I think as long as I go over there and just like shoot him a couple times, I will get kill credit, but it looks like everybody is just focusing on the boss. Is there gonna be a free for all by the way, once everybody like kills him, sap that guy, loot him, get grays, nice. So overall, that was actually a whole lot of fun. I don't know what the bloody tokens do though. I'm gonna look it up real quick and we'll see if we can do anything with them, but I currently have 354. I highly doubt that's enough enough for anything okay so i did look it up and i did know about this guy i just didn't know he had the bloody token option but yeah there it is right there so i can spend uh let's see bloody tokens on level 366 tier based pvp gear now i know i want the epics but the epics require much more if i talk to this guy you could see i need the blue version of this stuff plus trophies of strife the trophies of strife are what i'm going to get from this quest we just talked about i get eight of them for the quest that's at least one piece of gear you can't get a big piece that costs 10 but i can get a little piece that costs eight save a point and i don't know if i get eight next week or not but it just make me wonder will i be at nine and i still won't be able to get one of these bigger pieces now as i'm looking at this the stats aren't too bad i'm still a little iffy on my stat priority because every guide i see literally does say something different and that's not a lie some say haste is the best i saw one that did say crit one of them was actually saying mastery is what's best as long as you're at a certain haste cap i think it was 20 percent haste while in the arena but otherwise apparently it's mastery because we have a lot of good energy regen is what i heard now and apparently in previous expansions the energy wasn't as good so you really did need the haste but then otherwise it's been kind of up in the air thing i think it basically goes agi versatility mastery crit equals haste with that cap in mind right with that being said looking at drake beaker's vest i mean that's giving me mastery versatility it's actually pretty good i just don't see any guides telling me to use this set i'm not gonna lie i do see guides telling me to use the pve set in pvp but nothing for this this is interesting though i mean it's giving me 105 versatility for the two piece when i'm stunned i absorb 58,000 damage and actually dying in a stun is a definite weakness that can occur as a rogue so that feels good too the four piece and the other one says killing enemy players grants breakers friendly so that's horrible actually most of the time because that's giving me versatility and movement speed, stacking.
stacking. And I don't know how long the stack lasts, but it says kill enemy players, right? So if the stack lasts a really long time, it could be decent in world PvP, which is what it's intended for. Otherwise, meh. However, this is 421 item level in arenas and BGs. So it's not as good as the regular Crimson Gladiator stuff, but I can see myself going for the four piece set for this, just trying to get that extra, you know, versatility, quite literally. With that being said, I want to get a bunch of the little pieces, if I'm honest with you. So I want like the cowl, I want probably the boots, I want probably the gloves. So we can plan around that because you do need the bloody tokens to buy the blue one so that you can upgrade it into the epic one. So people on stuff I looked up were saying, oh no, bloody tokens, they're useless past week one. And maybe that's kind of true, figuratively speaking, as in after you use them one time for their intended purpose, like I am now trying to farm stuff, they'll eventually never have a use again. But honestly, it looks like to me at first glance that this is going to take a second to get. So I don't feel like it's a problem. So I'm just going to buy what I can actually afford. We won't be using it, obviously, but once we can upgrade it, that's going to be what we use to upgrade our gloves. Now, a lot of people are talking about how Sparks of Life just take an incredibly long time to farm. I told you about the grind thing earlier. I think the worst part is I don't have any battle pets. And so when this is up, I can never do the battle pet stuff. Like I have them, but I've never maxed them out. Let me know if you know an easy way to do that. Anyway, I guess the ultimate goal is going to be simply to do as many world quests like this one up here. I can try to do and also rares and killing players as I can. And that'll be a goal for the next video. And by the way, if you take a look at my great vault, I am good to go for the PVP side of things. And so I'm pretty happy with this so far. I think that we've done good, man. I mean, there was a really long journey and we did a lot of PVP. What I want to do is close this with a really quick snippet on my thoughts so far of solo shuffle. The pros, the cons, and my general thoughts. All right, guys, let's begin. Pros and cons and just general thoughts on solo shuffle right now after trying it, uh, I would say. Starting off with the negatives, the shuffling of players is interesting, right? Because it really depends on having good class balance. So in one match, there could be a Windwalker monk, right? His damage could be so high that he was globaling players. And based on how the team comps work, it just seems to be that every single match that the Windwalker plays in is a successful match for his teammates. As as you shuffle in random people, as long as they're on his team, they win. Now, I don't exactly understand how the shuffling works. My brain said that it probably would be something logical where everybody plays against each other an equal amount of times, but based on some of these clips I have, it looks like sometimes you play against one person four times, which actually I do think makes sense if that's true. But basically what that means is that if one person like that Windwalker monk is not you, you're basically guaranteed four losses. So in other words, the people that were on his team the most most are going to have the most rounds won. Now, I know what you're saying, that Windwalker deserves more ranking. Great, I agree. But I just think it's weird how it works out for everyone else. Because by the way, this goes the other way around as well. I had a match where there was a warrior and the warrior is pretty good, but it looked like every time the shaman was on somebody's team, the shaman would get automatically trained and he would die. He died almost every match first, no matter who was trying to kill him. There was one exception when he was on my team, we actually were able to kill the enemy team. And then there was, I think he maybe beat me also in one match as well. So I did pretty good that time, but I just thought to myself, the warrior, he got punished for it a lot. And then one of the times he was against me when I was with the shaman, I pulled it through. So the warrior was doubly punished, right? It's kind of weird. It's just weird. That's all, you know, in other words, it's class balance. Once again, like that's the biggest thing in the world. You just have to make sure it's really, really good. I'm not making a judgment call on me knowing what the meta is, but that's something I've noticed. The only other thing is the queue times are too long. You guys got to get in there and you got to queue, man, because I need more people to play with. Number one, I mean, the queue times, sometimes it says an average of seven minutes, but it's actually 20 minutes, 25. And you're like, how is that even possible? And then you get in there and it's really fun, right? But you have to wait so long to get in there. So get into solo shuffle. There's no requirement. It's so easy to get PVP gear and again, it's solo play, so you can immediately start playing. Now that's it for negatives for the pros. Number one, it's a solo player's rated PvP dream. I know, I'm a solo player, and one of my biggest gatekeeps of all time is having to form these like permanent structured groups just to do something that gives you good gear. Some people like that, some people don't. You know, it's not about being antisocial, by the way, on the side of not. It's more about keeping your internet life and people you meet on the internet at an arm's length. To me, that used to be normal, by the way, like 15, 20 years ago. I know things have changed. But honestly, I still think it's a solid rule of thumb. Now I can queue solo, I can keep everything in a text chat, and I feel good about it. And I earn gear, I have a rating associated with it, and it's overall really fun. Again, the only downside being the queue time. If the queue time was even five minutes, it would be glorious to be able to get in and get out with something like this. So it's really great. Number two, by the way, it's just super creative. It's not just a single 3v3 match where the team with a player left standing wins. You all know that if they said, we're gonna do a new solo 
game mode for PvP. That's exactly what you thought it would be. It would just be a shitty 3v3 match where everybody's random, and if you lose, it's a win-loss ratio for your score, and like, good luck, bro, because that's what everybody does, right? But actually, they tried to make it balanced. Isn't that interesting? They tried to think about the random concept. They said to themselves, what if you hate your team, but every single round, your team changes, and so if there's a really good player on the enemy team, he will help you at some point. And if there's a really shit player on your team, you will kill him at some point. How about that? And honestly, I think most people would think, yeah, actually, let's try that. If that was like the one that was like brought up to them, they'd be like, do you want it the way it is in any game mode you've ever played in any PVP game you've ever played? Or do you want it like this? They'd be like, yeah, I want it like this. Let's at least try it. I'm not saying it's perfect, but Jesus Christ, I have to say it's better than any other PVP games game mode. That's all random typically. And you just stick with the same team the whole time. So if you have an AFK -er, or a guy that doesn't care as much or two idiots on your team start shouting at each other and none of them are memeing, like, you lose! Not to mention if you get tilted, and it's not unfair to say people are going to be tilted when other people are being crappy. So the creativity behind this game mode actually fights against toxicity. You can't eradicate it, but it does get rid of some of the standard bits of what makes a toxic player in typical PvP game mode. Point is, in this, when you're constantly switching your teammates, a lot of what makes somebody dread stuff, be toxic, feel like the game is over, not want to play anymore, maybe even people that end up leaving, they sit there and they think, okay, I might have lost, but again, the guy that's really good is going to be on my team. The guy that's really bad, I'm going to be killing him soon. So I just think there are less options to troll. I do think when people do troll that it's really bad, but it's always bad. Let's not forget. It might feel bad because there are less times you feel bad. So I think it feels worse sometimes to some people on uh, Solo Shuffle. But ultimately, it's the same feeling. Somebody screwed you out of your match. But I just think it happens less. And by the way, keep in mind, as the season continues, people who troll like that will lose, So I'm telling you, so much MMR that you won't see them anymore. That might develop an ELO hell by the way, where people that are first ranking up their guys are like stuck. And that could be hilarious if that actually ends up happening. Now, some general thoughts on solo shuffle. Often players are going to identify somebody as the weakest link. So be on the watch for that. They typically, from my experience, they do this by like round two, maybe three. Now I will say I have had three classes stand out to me. All of them are melee and they've stood out to me as just being a cut above the rest because their damage is just so high and the pressure is so good. This is low rated first literal first impressions by the way so this is almost certainly going to change let me give you an example warrior is one of the ones i'm going to say but i didn't actually start switching around to different pvp talents like dismantle until like halfway through and once i started doing that my win rate against warrior went up i guarantee you that i'm still kind of like biased but i would say warrior dh and windwalker right and then i had some runner-ups for best classes i've seen assassination rogue demonology warlock rep paladin marksman hunter and those are just some examples there's actually a lot of variety right now there's definitely a gradient of potential so i think the tier lists are actually interestingly accurate specifically for wow right now but it is just something to keep in mind so i'm playing a class that can basically still compete but you might be playing one that's going to have a lot less of an option to compete there might be ways you can nichely play around it depending on who you're teamed up with you would want to memorize those whatever they may be and make sure you communicate before a match starts and you don't have a lot of time or you need to get the best gear you could possibly get and just get every advantage you can get with enchants and stuff and just really master that class and just hope that your skill alone is able to make up for some of that win rate that you would lose by playing something that's less good when other people are all playing the best stuff. Overall though guys, those are my thoughts. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to give it a like and subscribe. And by the way, make sure to become a member on the channel if that interests you, $1.99. You can help out the channel. And we've got a merch store right now. You can get some Mimi merch stuff and uh, that's pretty sick as well. But anyway guys, like and sub, like I said, I'll see you in the next video. Big doubles out.